So welcome. My name is Liz Woodham. I'm a member of the Enrich team here in Cambridge, and I'm joined by... I'm Charlie, uh, and I'm responsible mainly for resources on the secondary sites. And we're also joined by uh, Ems Lord, who's the director of Enrich. Hi, Ems. Um, uh, and we're delighted to have you all here this afternoon. It's a quick reminder, if you could make sure that your microphones are off, that would be really helpful. Thank you very much. We're, we're very grateful to uh, Trinity College here in uh, Cambridge. We're generous enough to fund our webinars so that they are free to you um, to participate. So we'd like to give you a little bit of background to set the scene, and then we will be doing some mathematics later on. Uh, and you're very welcome, please, to participate using the chat. Uh, as we invite you to work on the maths with us and do also post questions as we go and we'll do our best to answer them as we see them. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share a page on Enrich. <clears throat> um, so those of you who have attended um, webinars with us before or who, who are familiar with Enrich, we'll know that we use the um, Kilpatrick rope model as um, a framework as we create tasks uh, and resources on the Enrich website. So we'd like to briefly talk about this um, and explain how the rope model relates to the way that we organize our resources. So you can see from the image, the Kilpatrick rope model um, contains five strands, and these are um, depicting the characteristics of um, a good mathematician. And so two of these strands, the conceptual understanding and the procedural fluency, I think are pretty familiar to us all uh, as mathematics teachers. And these strands, we, um, we would suggest to you that if those are what you would like to develop with your students, our mapping document is a great place to, to find appropriate resources. We'll, we'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, the productive disposition, so that is about students seeing mathematics as worthwhile. It's about them having a, a what we might refer to as a growth mindset. You know, I, I believe that if I work hard at mathematics, I can get better at the subject. Uh, I, I enjoy it and I'm prepared to be resilient as I work on mathematical problems. Again, that's reflected on the website and, it, it, uh, and we have organized our resources um, according to mathematical mindsets. And we'll show you that shortly. The last two strands of Kilpatrick's rope model are about those skills that you, you bring to bear as you're faced with um, a mathematical problem. So strategic competence, do I know what to do if I'm given a task that um, is a challenge to me and, and I've not seen before? Can I use my reasoning to explain why I've tackled it in a particular way? Could I go on to prove my solution? Now, if we go to the secondary teacher landing page, so to get there, I would use the menu here on the left-hand side, the teacher menu. You can see that in these first three boxes, the way that we've organized the resources, we hope um, fits very nicely with the Kilpatrick model. So on the left-hand side are curriculum linked problems, those are the way that you, you might um, access resources if you're thinking about the conceptual fluency and the procedural understanding um, as, as your, your, your main focus, perhaps. If you're looking to develop students' mathematical mindsets, so, this, so encouraging them to be more curious, work together, uh, resilient uh, and resourceful, then you could click here. And this third way of organizing our resources is about developing the mathematical thinking skills and those are the adaptive uh, reasoning and the strategic competence aspects of the rope model. Charlie, I think I'm going to leave you to talk a bit more about these in particular. Okay, so uh, the two threads of the rope model felt uh, covered a lot of ground. So what we've done is we've offered slightly more granularity, mm -hmm. a little bit more detail, so we've split this up into five different headings. And the five feel like they mirror the kind of journey that we often take when we're confronted with a new problem, uh, all the way to resolving 
line. So um, top left, exploring and noticing, which is the one that we're going to focus on today. So this is the stage where you're given a problem, you're not quite sure what to do, um, and it's sort of roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, uh, slightly messy work, but in the process of doing that, you start noticing, um, making discoveries, having some insights that will be the springboard to eventually, hopefully, a final solution. Um, second section, working systematically, uh, it follows on from the slightly haphazard, random, chaotic, messy work that we, we've done at the beginning. Uh, thirdly, we start uh, making sense of the situation and we start making conjectures, perhaps going on to generalize. And in the process, we might want to start explaining why things happen. So we might be able to visualize what's going on or Joe Boyle talks about multiple representations. So it could be numerical, diagrammatic, algebraic, or it could be the business about, well, you can explain, you can, you can use fractions or decimals. Uh, or percentages, for example, different representations. Um, and finally, uh, the fifth element that we've focused on is to do with uh, coming up with uh, convincing uh, arguments. Uh, so reasoning, explaining, uh, uh, and possibly proving. So this is the order in which we've listed these. And this is the order in which we're going to be doing our next, this webinar and the next four. We're going to work through these four, these five. And today, we want to dip into four problems, if we have time, and just focus on the very first stage. So we may mention where this might lead to, but apologies if you're desperate to work on a problem and see it to, to its conclusion. I'm afraid we're not going to give you time. We don't, we don't have time to do that in, in 45 minutes. But we will uh, we will introduce the problems to highlight the value of giving students some time to uh, go through that exploratory stage and highlight what they, what they might notice. Uh, we may make, make remarks about where this is going to lead to, mm -hmm. but but uh, we will be we will be dashing through this uh, in order to. And make time to, 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 if possible, to to do all four problems. Um, okay, is mm -hmm. there anything else I should be saying, Liz? No, I, I do, should we? I, I guess our um, if you, if we think about, my, let's just say a word about exploring and noticing before we try our first problem. Um, it, if we think about professional mathematicians, they are grappling with problems that genuinely nobody knows the solution to yet. Um, there's no you used a nice word, roadmap for them. And we are trying to give students that experience in the classroom. Um, and so, shall we have a go at our first problem? Okay. Okay, so Liz has got the number jumbler on the screen. Can you go down one more? Yeah. There we are. Um, and so, uh, so some of you may know this problem, but we're, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes on it. So it starts by asking you to choose a two-digit number. So anything between 10 and 99, please, can you all choose a two-digit number? Um, you know, 24, 37, 76, 81, 90, whatever. Um, I'll choose 42 just for the sake of it, just to work through an example. Once you've chosen your two digit number, please add together both digits. So in my case, I had 42, I'm gonna add the four and the two, and yeah. I'm gonna get six. Mm -hmm. Once you've added your digits, can you subtract that total from your original number? And you should find that your solution is somewhere on the chart on the right hand side, mm -hmm. And what I'd like you to do is find your solution and look at the icon, the image that is just to the right of your solution. In a minute, we're gonna jumble all the icons up. 
So we'd really like you to remember what it is you're looking at. Okay, hopefully I've given you all enough time. We'll jumble up all the icons. A sunflower has come out, which is the image that I was looking at. And me. So I wonder what happened to everybody else. Could you in the chat just post what the image was? Was it the same as the one that we got or was it different? Ooh. Well, this is very reassuring. Everybody's arithmetic is <laughs> as good as we were expecting. <laughs> Um, everybody who's posted has said it's they also got the sunflower. So you can imagine this being the starting point for a mathematical discussion. Mm. Students um, wondering why this happened, why this happened. So um, in a classroom, mm. the students might want us to do this again. Yes. Um, we're not going to have time to do it again. But what we'd like you to do instead is imagine you were doing it again and getting students to talk and discuss and compare, not necessarily the icon that they got, no. but what was the result of the subtraction? So when you did your, you started with the number, you added the digit, did a subtraction. Can you write in the chat yeah. what you got when you did the subtraction? Yes. So what was the number that was next to the sunflower icon? 18, 45, 63, 36, 9, 45, 18, 81. Fifty-four. I'm not sure it's possible to get thirty-one. Vanessa, I think you're right, but I'm not sure the 65 and 31 are possible. Okay, so now comes the noticing stage. Right, which you are doing quite naturally, yes. And all the numbers that I read out are indeed multiples of nine. Yeah. And that then becomes a springboard for discussions about why does this work, That's how right. does this work, and we're not going to explain why it works and how it works. You'll have to come to a future webinar. <laughs> and if we revisit this problem, there will be a, an opportunity to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But something about place value could be a, a sort of a window into a yeah. solution. Absolutely. Writing numbers algebraically. Yeah. A, B equals 10, A plus B. What am I subtracting? Mm -hmm. um, are all, but, but that's going along the journey and we don't have time for that. So we're going to stop there. Really sorry. <laughs> but I hope that you can see why that exploratory stage and the noticing does offer the opportunity to pro prompt, to provoke questions yes. that will in then engender mathematical discussion and thinking. Absolutely. And crucially, the, the, the exploration has led to these meaningful questions the exploration was not a sort of a play around that we did and is not relating to what we go on to do it leads into what we do next okay we're not going to do that second problem yeah we're rushing because we've only given ourselves five minutes for each problem i'm not going to show the next problem on the screen actually okay. to start with let's use the visualizer so i'm going to stop sharing um the enrich website instead we're going to introduce this task using the visualizer so this problem is called uh, add to 200. And Charlie, what I'd like you to do is you've very carefully prepared already four boxes. Could you please, in those four boxes, um, enter a digit in each one, a single digit in each one. So use uh, you could use zero if you like, zero to nine. If you want to, you could re repeat digits. Um, that's up to you. Okay. If you could fill four in, in those boxes, I'm please. I'm two or four. Mm -hmm. A seven and a four. Okay, thank you. So we're going to imagine that we're going to read off, using those boxes, we're going to read off four 
two digit numbers. So let's look at the top first. So on the top row, I'm going to read off the number 24. On the bottom row, we're going to read off the number 74. And then we're going to gener generate another two digit number reading down the left hand column. So that's 27. And then finally, along the right down the right hand column, we've got 44. And we're going to find the total of those. So Charlie, I wonder if we can find the total of those. 169. Uh, uh, I don't know how you did that so quickly, but it's not about speed. Um, so Charlie got a total of 169 in that case. Our challenge to you is can you place four digits in, in four boxes in that way to generate four two digit numbers just like Charlie did. But this time we'd like you to try to find the four digits that make four two digit numbers that have a sum of exactly 200. So this is your challenge. Now, what we would love you to do, we're going to give you some thinking time, have a go. If you find a solution, could you please pop it in the chat? And I think possibly the easiest way to do that is if you list the four digits that you've used and perhaps go top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. So in this case, as Charlie's writing, Charlie would have posted 2474. And then we can figure out um, exactly where you've placed them. So over to you. The challenge is to create a total of 200. Thank you very much for the solutions that are coming in so far. That's brilliant. Um, Charlie has been placing some of those solutions uh, under the visualizer, as you can see. We're not convinced that 2882 is a solution. If, if we're assuming we're going top left, top right, 28, bottom left, 8, and then another 2, we don't think we can make 200 using those. Um, we'll leave you a few more minutes. Keep them coming in. Okay, I said we didn't have very much time. And if you look at what's on the screen at present, I've put the solutions that have arrived so far and I've organized them in a very particular order. Mm -hmm. Liz and I have done this problem with students and instead of little post-its that I've got on our, our table here, we've done it with big sheets of A4 paper yeah. and blue tack, and we've plastered these on the wall. And the reason I've put them in that particular order is that when you have all the solution, possible solutions, you end up getting something like this. Yeah, so so imagine, because we're limited for time, we, we are going to sort of fast forward, if you like. 
Yeah, so we got to imagine, you've got to imagine you've had 20 minutes or so mm -hmm. to work on this problem and you've managed to find nearly all the solutions. There are some gaps. Actually, the gaps are the ones that um, I've taken out to put onto there. But you might want to have a look mm. and see whether you notice any patterns. Mm -hmm. Why is it that I arrange the solutions in that particular order? What are the patterns you can see? Could you use the patterns to help you work out the, misses, the missing pieces? It's like a jigsaw puzzle that becomes easier and easier and easier the more pieces are on, on the board. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a few seconds and I might put some of the missing jigsaw puzzles back. <laughs> If you notice uh, any particular patterns, do feel free to post them in the chat. Yeah. Why is the question, which we're not going to have time to answer, I'm afraid, this afternoon, Vanessa, but thank you. <laughs> you might notice the far right-hand corner. I cheated. Yeah, this, this is, yeah, an interesting notation, Charlie. Because I wanted it to be symmetrical, I created a single-digit number called T for 10, <laughs> which... Uh, um, it's quite neat. So, Liz, yes. when we've worked with students, some of the things that students have noticed yes. is that all the numbers in one of the, on one of the diagonals always add up to an even total, and the numbers on the other diagonal always add up to an odd total. Yes, by a diagonal, you're looking at your box of four digits. And so, if you, yes, exactly right. If you go top right to bottom left you've got an even total top left to bottom right you've got an odd total interesting yeah that's always the case yes i can notice some patterns and i know students notice this too going down a column so if we go down a column the top left digit is the same in each case and the bottom right and the bottom right and the other two digits always add up to the same total nice so I mean, there are other patterns, are but lots. we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. But it seems to us that there's some interesting mathematical questions that need answering. Absolutely. Following on from this exercise mm -hmm. and from organizing the solutions in this particular way, yes. which could then lead to questions about place value. Why are all the numbers on one column? What, why do they have the same sort of pair of numbers on the leading diagonal, if we mm -hmm. think about top left to bottom right, mm -hmm. why doesn't it make any difference if the other two numbers are different? That's right. Um, and we can talk about place value, we can write these things algebraically. If, for example, we think about our four cells as A, B, C, D, then the final solution will have 20 lots of A, 11 lots of B, 11 lots of C, and two lots of D, because A is going to appear in the tens column of two numbers. Yeah. B is going to appear in the tens and in the units, C in the tens and the units. And so writing things in that way will lead to a better understanding of what's happening. Yeah. But enough. Enough about <laughs> this, because that is to put your appetite to come on another. Absolutely. I think what's interesting, Charlie, about this problem and our previous one, our number jumbler, actually working on this collaboratively, which links back to the previous webinar we did, has generated a lot of examples more quickly than if I sat and worked on this on my own. And I imagine, you know, for many students, that's really motivating to be able to see many examples and to start asking those questions, questions and noticing um, it more immediately than having to... You know. it, it can be very frustrating, this problem, because it could take, but also by posting yes. answers as a solution, when I'm done with students, I've got them to write the solutions and post them on, on, on the wall. And it means that other students can benefit from That's that. Right. And those who find it really difficult to find a solution early on can start noticing patterns. To generate and, more. And yeah. that shows the value. But Okay, enough. <laughs> So um, that, that task, just in I said, was called Add to 200. And um, we can, oh, no, uh, 
uh, we are still sharing the visualizer. Sorry, let me stop sharing the visualizer and share the, we'll go back to the Enrich site. So this is um, adds to 200, which is the problem we've just tried. Um, and so you can, at the moment, um, your students may like to know, you may like to know, this is a live task. It's a secondary live task. So do have a go at this with your class and send in some of your students' solutions. So Charlie, shall we, sorry. No, I think we're gonna go back to the secondary yep. teacher's page. That's right. So like Liz said, problems tagged by curriculum topic can be found here. Problems tagged by mathematical mindset can be found here. We've been focusing and we're going to focus for these five webinars on the mathematical thinking, on the five elements that we've identified. Yeah. And today we're focusing on exploring and noticing. And what we've done in preparation for today is produce some guidance, just like we did for the collaborative, for those of you who were here with us a couple of months ago for our previous webinar, and so we've produced a page which has got some ideas here that might help you when you're back at school or when you've got meetings with colleagues to think about mm -hmm. how you might uh, embed exploring and using noticing uh, as a springboard for further mathematical activity. Yeah. And we've split this up into three sections. Something about values and ethos. We've put some ideas that we found really useful about structural considerations. And our final heading is about facilitating. We'll talk about each very quickly mm -hmm. because you can then go back to this page and you can find this uh, and we'll show you again at the end. And at the very bottom of the page, there are some other resources that you might find interesting. Mm -hmm. So, Key ideas in values and ethos yes. is uh, that we believe that students can make some progress and teachers can, um, without having to have everything demonstrated to them by the teacher. Absolutely, that's a key idea. And, and alongside that, I think, is this idea that messy work is valuable. So one of our key beliefs is that, you know, <laughs> Having to present your work neatly can sometimes stifle children, um, particularly those who are more anxious about mathematics or are not confident mathematicians. So it being valued, those messy jottings being valued, just like I'm sure you were doing when we tried that um, add to 200 problem, that is part of our mathematical thinking, those wrong turns those the, and those mistakes as well. Um, I think those are our key the key ideas we'll talk about. There's more, but you can read those. Yes, there are five bullet points. Yes. Um, we're not going to talk through them because that would mean there'd be less time to do maths. Exactly. So structural considerations, there were two key ideas here. Yeah. One is in terms of how one might structure a lesson or a series of lessons. And Alan Wigley and Ken Rutherford have written very short articles and we've linked to them there. But in both cases, I mean, Ken talks about uh, exploration, codification, consolidation. Mm -hmm. This idea that the teacher will codify students thinking into perhaps um, mathematical terminology yeah. or uh, yeah. uh, how, how mathematicians uh, li li like to describe the situation, but building on students' ideas. Yes, that's key, yeah. And, and the other key idea that, that we've mentioned in sort of considerations is this idea that we use low threshold, high ceiling tasks, which is what we try and produce here at Enrich, so that they're accessible for everybody, but they have some follow-up questions. That's right. And we'll visit those when we do the next two problems. Yeah. If we, uh, do you want to say something about facilitating? Yeah, okay. So, so facilitating, I guess, is about how to make what we just said all come alive in the mathematics classroom. What's the nitty gritty that we as teachers need to be thinking about? So Peter Lilliadal, um has written a book, 14 Practices for Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics, which is really worth reading, particularly um, in relation to exploring and noticing is practice six. And he offers some, um, some thoughts about not only the idea of when you might introduce a task, so right at the beginning of the 
lesson, uh, cueing students in straight away to a challenge, but he also discusses how you engage them uh, and, and he offers advice about the kind of questions, a little bit further down, the questions that we as teachers should focus on answering when students answer questions. Are we really um, uh, helping students to continue to think in our classrooms. So if we if we um, discipline ourselves, I guess, uh, to only answer the questions that encourage thinking, um, then, then students are going to take more of that responsibility that we talked about earlier. It's not about the teacher validating and having to do the teaching first. Is there anything key that you would like to pull out? No, and time's up. So it's okay. time for another bit of math. More math. More math. <laughs> Good stuff. So we've got a nice ge geometry problem for you now. Um, shall I set the scene quickly? Yes. And then you can... Okay. So here we have got a, um, a what I would call a nine-dot circle. So you've got a circle with nine dots equally spaced around the circumference. Um, and now what we've done is we have... Uh, drawn in some radii um, and we can use these radii to find out angles at the center so Charlie I'm guessing if we know that we've we've got nine equally spaced dots we know that there are 360 degrees um, in a full turn so 360 divided by 9 40 degrees so we know that at the center here we've got 40 degrees so I guess Knowing that, I, I I can see that this is going to be 80, uh, and here we've got three segments, so three lots of 40 is 120. And if we did that, yeah, that's one, two, three, four, that angle there will yes. be 160. Yes, agreed. Now we can use that mm -hmm. to help us work out the angles in these isosceles triangles. Great, okay, let's give it a go. Because if this angle is 40, yes. and this angle is if this triangle is isosceles, yes. because it's got two equal sides, these two angles must be 70. Agreed. And if this angle is 80, yeah. then these two angles must be 50. And if this angle is 160, then these angles must be 10. 10, yes, okay. And what's really useful about this is that then we can use it to work out the angles of a cyclic quadrilateral. So okay. this problem is called cyclic quadrilaterals, mm -hmm. and we can work out the angles of the cyclic quadrilateral by splitting this up into four isosceles triangles. Are we going to give everybody a chance to work out the angles? Okay. We should. So using what we've just, we just chatted about, please could you work out the, um, the interior angles of this quadrilateral? Um, and perhaps if you could post them in the chat, maybe reading off in clockwise, in a clockwise direction. Yes, I don't think it matters whether you go clockwise or anti-clockwise, but can you please, once you've started going in a particular order, carry on going in that order. Yeah. So that we get the four angles um, as um, adjacent angles. We're almost on time. Maybe we can change. Is that what we're doing? Thank you very much. Now we were going to give everybody a chance to draw their own cyclic quadrilateral because you could draw different ones. Um, you could draw this one, or you might mm. want to um, draw that one, yep. or you might 
want to draw that one. And we were going to ask you to give us the angles. Yes. And if we were with the class, we would do that. Yeah, and we could gather them on the board. We could create a table. Okay. Now you're faster at typing than me. I'll try. So I'm going to read out some sets of angles okay. that students might get. Yes. So 140, 80, 40, and 100. Yep. So we're doing this very quickly, but of course students would, give, would be given the opportunity to do all this at their own speed and slowly gather the information on the board. That's right. Okay. While Liz is typing, what we'd like you to do is to look at the results that are appearing on the board. What do you notice? Mm -hmm. So the next row, 100, 100, 80, 80. And again, in the chat, you might want to write down what you notice. 120, 120, 60, 60. You can you can put that one. Um, that, yeah, you can write that. Thank one. you, Charlotte. We can add this one as well. So the one in row five that Charlotte has given is yep. possibly the same one as the one in row one. Yes. But Charlotte has started counting at the angle with one twenty. That's right. Where, uh, but you can see that the order, as you go from 120 to 80 to 60 and then back. Mm. Now, so, somebody has noticed that columns A and column C always add up to 180. Yeah. And of course, students won't notice this immediately. immediately. They will comment that they're all multiples of 10 or multiples of 20. But eventually, yes, that realization that the opposite angles, so A and C, B and D, mm add up to 180, mm -hmm. will hopefully prompt the question. Does that always happen? Does this always happen? Does it only happen on nine dot circles? Good question, yeah. Is it is there something special about nine dots? Yeah. And so again, a bit of work gathering the information, mm -hmm. organizing it onto a table so that students can notice patterns can then be the springboard for some more work. And if we look at the problem on cyclic quadrilaterals on the, on the site, we've got printable sheets for 9, 10, 12, 15, 18 dot circles. And the problems carry on like d down here. Yeah, there are so, more interactivities. That, so that's got 10 dots and so on. We start with nine dots because the arithmetic is so simple. Yeah. All the angles that you get are multiples of 20. Yeah. But in future yeah. lessons, we, in future webinars, we might come back to explaining why all this happens. Mm -hmm. We don't have time for doing that today. We don't. The apologies, but hopefully there's an appreciation that you can see the value yes. in getting students stuck into this problem. Absolutely. But also really importantly is that students often do circle theorems when they're a bit older in the secondary school. Mm -hmm. And all they've needed here is to know that the angles in a full circle add up to 360. The angles in a triangle add up to 180. Yeah. Maybe the, the angles in a quadrilateral add up to yeah. 360 and something about isosceles triangles. Yeah. So actually, there's no reason why they couldn't be doing this work when they are sort of practicing working out missing angles. Yeah. And at the same time, learn about cyclic quadrilaterals. That's right. That's right. right. We've got time for one last problem. One last problem. <clears throat> this is another geometrical one. Um, Okay, so um, we have quick and efficient ways of working out the area of a one by one square, yep. or a two by two, or a three by three, or a four by four, or five, and, and actually 20 by 20, we could know the area is 400. Yeah. And very, very quickly we can yep. work it out. Yep, yep, yep. And I can also give you the area, you can tell me tell what, the, the, what the length is. Yeah. Wouldn't it be fabulous we could say to our students, yep. if we could also, just as quickly, work out the area of squares that are tilted, mm. that are like that one, or like that one, or like that one. Now, students may not yet know how, to, may, may be unsure about how to work out the area of this, but the, 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 the big question is, can we find a quick and easy way? Now, in order to do so, we need to find the areas of some squares. Yes. And in the getting started section of tilted squares, we've offered two suggestions. One is 
that students can box a tilted square, yeah. work out the area of the box, take away the areas of the triangles that are not needed. So in this case, uh, this square, um, to get from one vertex to the next one, you go three across and one up, yeah. and um, you box it in for the four by four square, take away the four triangles, so you end up with an area of 10. But you could just as easily split it up like this. Yes, so a smaller square in the middle. So again, we would give students time. Yeah, to generate some examples. To draw, to practice working out areas. And you might start by being quite systematic and say, well, let's just work out the areas of squares where you go across and you just go one up. A tilt of one, if you like. And next session we're doing, next webinar is going to be about working systematically. Mm -hmm. So we haven't denied about using this example. But just to give you some idea about how the exploring and noticing and the working systematically sort of go hand in hand. So you might then be gathering results um, for one across, one up, I happen to know that the area is two. And for two across, one up, the area is five. And three across, one up, the area is 10. Mm. And these results might be the results that are generated by Thank students. You. Absolutely. We're doing a bit of fast forwarding again. 17, Ooh. 26. What do you notice about these numbers? Mm. So again, on the chat, can you tell us what you notice about the results when you go from one vertex to another by going across and then just one up? Okay. Now, of course, the surprise and excitement of this problem is lost on all of you because you all know <laughs> about Pythagoras. But there is a recording of a lesson that a colleague mm -hmm. and I did many years ago, and it's on the Tilted Squares. Yeah, so if we go back to Tilted Squares and go to the teacher's resources, it is, isn't it, Charlie? Yes. And scroll down, and it's broken, you've, you've very helpfully broken it up into chunks, into sections. It's three sections, the introduction, the middle of the lesson, and then, and then the end, which marry, which sort of are similar to the exploratory stage, to then working together and finishing with an exp with a proof. Yeah. So again, this we wanted to show you this as an example of how that messy stage at the beginning, mm. when organised in a particular way, which is where the role of the teacher can be really helpful, where Ken Rutherford talks about codifying can then help to lead to the conjectures of the generalizing, which then requires to explain and prove. And we'll re revisit those elements of thinking mathematically at future webinars. In future webinars, exactly. But the, so apologies that this is rushed, <laughs> um, but we wanted to give you a flavor of why we think that the exploring and noticing stage is so important. Exactly. Um, and I think what we'd like to do now is just to remind you where you can find our guidance uh, on the website. So um, we're back now to the secondary teacher landing page and Charlie explained that one way to find it is by going to the developing mathematical thinking section. And then if we scroll down exploring and noticing, and there's a link to the developing the guidance up, up here. Um, I think it was the link below, but never mind. Um, um, but alternatively, we know that some of you, okay, some of you who are joining us this afternoon are here because you have recently become uh, joined our Problem Solving Schools initiative, or perhaps some of you are thinking about becoming a Problem Solving School. So another way of finding this guidance is to go to our Problem Solving Schools page that Charlie has just done. And if you click the third box, which is resources and professional development, you can see at the top of the page the being collaborative resources that we prepared for last time's webinar, but then scrolling down a little bit, here on the left-hand side, you've got that guidance page that we've been referring to, which we've talked through uh, some of the key elements of, 
but you have also got uh, groups of collections of tasks. There's one for primary and one for secondary. So what we've done is we've collected together tasks that we particularly think give students opportunities to explore uh, and to, to reflect on what they notice. Um, so do take a look at those as well. Um, the recording for today's webinar will go on that developing mathematical, the, 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 the accompanying page that we've been talking about. Oh, we've galloped through that. Um, please, if you have time, do fill in our evaluation form. Ems, I don't know if you've popped it in the chat. No, I've lost the chat off the side of the screen. Where's the chat? Here's the chat. While you're looking for it. Uh, not quite yet. Let me see if I can pop up the chat link. She might have the, or maybe, 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 maybe. Not sure I've okay. seen the link. Oh, thank you, Ems. Brilliant. There is the link to the evaluation form. Please do complete that if you can. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And I think ultimately, Charlie, we should summarize by saying, what we are trying to do is we're trying to give um, students an experience of being actively engaged in their mathematics learning. Um, we've been reading recently, and we must look up where, um, about maths being perhaps fossilized. Students' experience of mathematics tends to be fossilized. It, it's not meaningful to them. It's passed down to them, you know, this has already been discovered and dusted and we're just telling you about it way. And Rich is offering you um, a way of structuring your lessons so that students become actively involved and make the discoveries themselves and build on them um, to become mathematicians. Anything to add, Charlie? I'm sorry that felt incredibly rushed. <laughs> We're thinking that in future our webinars will last 50 minutes rather than 45 minutes. Maybe that extra five minutes will be useful. The extra five minutes is going to be really good. <laughs> so if you have any views about that, perhaps post it in the feedback form. We're trying to uh, fit in as much maths as possible because that's what the previous feedback told us. Um, we don't want to repeat what's already written and that you can access yourself. But if we've got the balance right today, it would be useful to know. Uh, so yes, do, we do read the feedback. Um, uh, so really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for joining us this afternoon. We hope you have a good rest of the evening and um, hope to see you again at a future webinar. Thank you. <laughs>